The Warhol is a masterpiece. Wounded in sexual intimacy, the role of voyeur was the perfect position to take for an artist. Andy Warhol emerged as a mysterious, ambiguous personality designed to challenge, perplex, and entice the media. This was new. This was marketing genius. Fame was guaranteed. The Warhol persona would need a private stage to present his meticulously crafted identity. The Factory. Andy's creative intelligence created his first artistic masterpiece, himself. All the love he hoped to share in a personal love relationship could be sublimated in making art. In his new independence, he found the power to influence others in paradox. He directed other people with non direction. He activated other people to interpret his work by devaluing it. His passivity and feigned ignorance generated endless publicity. Having no secrets amplified curiosity about him. He invented himself as a pop icon, a thought leader by not leading. Welcome to the video podcast, The Brain from Knowing to Doing. This is the creativity part of the series, and I'm delighted to introduce my friend, Dr. Philip Romero, MD, who is a very renowned retired assistant professor of psychiatry at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Well Medical College, Cornell University, and he's in private practice as a child family psychiatrist. But he is equally renowned as an artist, author of five books, and a filmmaker. His professional art career began in Galveston, Texas during medical school. He first met Andy Warhol in 1976 at an exhibit in New Orleans and continued a friendship with him for a decade before he passed. Andy inspired his art, writing, and thinking. And we're going to be focusing the second part of this podcast on Andy Warhol's brain, the marvelous new book that he has just published. But before we start on Andy Warhol, his other books, The Art Imperative, in 2010, he created a series of video interviews with artists and neuroscientists. He lives and works in New York City, and Philip, it's marvelous to speak to you. Um, Evian, so good to uh, reconnect in this uh, format. You know, we met so many years ago at a, an IT conference um, in San Francisco, and you were head and shoulders uh, the best presenter. And I said, I got to talk to that guy. So I'm happy to share with you uh, lots of insight, lots of fun stories about creativity. Love it. Well, let's let's take it in a cadence where I'd love to start off a little bit with the Art Imperative, which I just found a marvelous book when you shared it with me in uh, in uh, in San Francisco all those years ago. And I want to start off with a quote, the beginning of the book, because I think what's changed since that time in my mind, Philip, is how seriously creativity has been taken as a gravitas arena in this new world of converging. Um, innovation and AI, and also for applied integrative neuroscience in, in myself and our communities, it's about the importance of the non-conscious brain and intuition. So these are no longer esoteric concepts. They are being taken extremely seriously, and you begin your book with this quote, art presents a paradox. Although it seems to have no apparent utilitarian function, its ubiquitous existence throughout the world suggests the opposite. There must be some secret power encrypted in art that promotes survival value, an art imperative. Share with us a little bit about the 
gravitas of that context? Well, um, as a, um, a doctor, uh, a developmental um, uh, clinician, um, I knew that creativity was universal in childhood. All children make art. Um, some of us can't stop doing it for the rest of our lives. Most kids, by the time they're seven or eight, are doing something else and they leave art um, back in uh, grade school. Um, so, um, but when we look across time, uh, and the book uh, Art Imperative starts with the cave paintings 40,000 years ago in um, uh, France, in, in those uh, Chauvet cave paintings, which are just beautiful and so well preserved. Um, when I um, began to think about, you know, what happened in human evolution, and that stuff just popped up, and it never went away. Um, and, uh, you know, 30,000 years later, 10,000 years ago, we learned farming and built walls and cities that started to compete on a cultural scale. But we didn't stop making art. Everything from functional pottery to frescoes and jewelry and, and all sorts of things. So, you know, I asked myself, well, what is this value of art making in culture? It's, it's ubiquitous. Um, it must have some intrinsic value. And that's where the term the art imperative comes from. Um, 150 years ago, a uh, Viennese uh, art historian, uh, Alois Regal, um, presented the concept that art uh, criticism is going to die unless we put science in it. And he said that when you look at art, Mr. A or Mr. B, their brain reconstructs it. He wasn't a brain scientist yet, but he says the, the uh, beholder's share is very private and very personal. When I spoke to Aaron Kendall and we shot a video at the Annoy Gallery in front of the Klimt's painting, um, Aaron said it very elegantly. Uh, he said, when the, when the viewer looks at a painting, um, the, uh, the, the brain doesn't take a picture of it, and then look at it in the mind's eye. What happens is, you know, the neural stimulation uh, turns into neural connection. The brain reconstructs it with all of this um, incredible complexity in the occipital cortex that views the world. Um, and then it reintegrates it with its own private experience, memory, emotion, uh, interest, novelty, all these things that are very private with your history of art. Very cool. So I love, and I love the fact Eric Kandel, he has a, a, a neuroscience Nobel laureate, and he, he then started to focus on the issue of creativity and art. So just before we move on to Andy Warhol's brain, just a little bit further, you know, I was really shocked to your point when I had an exhibition in New York and people said to me, what does your abstract expressionist art mean? Like, what is the exact meaning of that? Painting? And I'd go, well, you know, it's abstract expression. So I said, what do you think it means? And I was, you know, in New York, not the least articulate people in the world. Person after person blew my mind with like this raw shock evaluation of insight into their emotions, their feelings, their thoughts, their associated patterns. And it really highlighted to me how underestimated our non-conscious brain, our intuition is. Less so now, as I say, as people delve into the convergence of how we are best going to adapt to AI, to these uncertainties. And as the World Economic Forum predicts that the future of jobs is going to be increasingly empowered, where the people will be most empowered by the people who are creative. So just to let's speed through the history of art, just with one other touch point, which is abstract expressionism, because you've started now the unfolding of bringing in feeling and emotion. What about the abstract expressionism movement before we get to the marvelous Andy Warhol and pop art and beyond and, and how much more he was than just a pop artist? But what is the concept in your mind that really made this, that blew the door open with respect to now getting an entirely different kind of symbolism into from our non-conscious brains um, into, into art. Well, once again, we have the story of uh, culture, a stable, 
functioning, um, all the hierarchies there in feudal to 19th century Europe. Uh, and then things start to break down. And so art reframes from the, the um, studio art of the salons and all that stuff and clipped was sort of the end of that to the experimental stuff of the, um, uh, the color experiments, Picasso and Cubism um, and so forth. Uh, something new is happening almost in anticipation of massive adversity. Uh, so those precede World War I. World War I devastates the, the war to end all wars. And what happens to art? Art goes wild. Culture goes wild. Uh, jazz and, uh, you know, music and fashion and everything. The dresses are up. You know, everybody's shaken up. It's none of this stiff, formal 19th century stuff. So uh, art is released. And a flood of new uh, uh, expression uh, comes out, the neo-expressions uh, in Germany especially. Well, the war to end all wars lasted 20 years before, you know, Hitler came on the scene and said, there, this world is horrible. Let's fix it. Um, so the Nazis came in with their rigid art, uh, their uh, propaganda art, and decimated Europe. So it was almost as if World War II ended European culture as we knew it. Now, outside of Europe, in America, this little group of you know, middle-aged guys were, who had been influenced by Picasso and, and all that, uh, particularly Jackson Pollock, um, left it all together. The whole idea in abstract expressionism was to leave the figure, get out of the body. It's been dead. It's been wiped out. The body is no longer a subject of interest. So the mind is, and Barnett Newman um, talked about this very importantly as uh, the search for the sublime uh, or, you know, the spiritual. Uh, and what was going on with the abstract expressionists and their experiments are just incredible. Uh, the scale, the complexity, um, and so that little handful of people reinvented art. <laughs> it never existed before. And now it was the vocabulary that ran for the next uh, 20 to 40 years. And, and Andy will fill, fit in here in a moment. <laughs> Absolutely. For beautifully put. So I have to say, I uh, love that summary, of course. And uh, I do say that as a student of the non-conscious brain, I was fascinated that uh, Freud, was inspiring the Dada movement to start with symbolism. Oh, and yes. Explore, and I'm a, you know, I'm a Dadaist probably, and I love surrealism more than anything because of the symbolic nature of the deep meaning of associations of all, and that the brain is an association system. That's so right. So I love that whole reflection of art in um, that reflects this entire... It's sort of in neuroscience anyway, this underexplored uh, uh, di dimension of the brain, the non-conscious brain, was yet explored magnificently by artists and not by neuroscientists. And that's right. why when I was a neuroscientist, that's why it was such a pleasure when I met you and that when I when I shared with you that I was an abstract expressionist artist who, who, was, who was, had set up the world's first standardized integrative database to reconcile, to bring together the non-conscious brain and the conscious brain. Our worship of rationality was well well founded, but yeah. it neglected the un because it didn't have uh, it didn't have words or numbers. Neglected the incredible power of association and patterns and symbols of probably our first language, which was non-conscious communication cues, voice tonalities. So that was why this art is so much more than just an esoteric cool thing it always was and why your art imperative idea has such gravitas in my mind in the history of humanity that it is a very integral part of human expression and a marvelous reflection of what is going on in the culture at all times but that said you helped you helped me so much to understand Andy Warhol I mean <laughs> we're now jumping to the other end of the spectrum all these you know 
genres of the genre in in of the abstract expression of which probably one of the best known is pop art and when i first saw andy warhol's incredible symbolic associations i thought that was his claim to fame and especially having you know when he cut when he started to you know came up with that notion everybody's going to have 15 minutes of fame but you help me understand that he was quite a genius in his own way and i write to read a little quote from page 26 in your marvelous book andy Warhol's brain and it is this and I'd, we, of course, I'd love to now hear the story of your whole journey with Andy. Take your while, but just before you do, I'd love to read this one. Andy was a philosophical artist with words, images, films, and actions. Commercial art was a job. Cultural impresario became his career. Everything he created was ambiguous, filled with ambivalence wit, irony, and reflected his own enigmatic identity. And I just thought that is my segue to you to go roll it out. Tell us about (laughs) your your friendship with Andy and and tell us about the essence of Andy Warhol's brain and what you've learned about the brain from Andy Warhol. Well, it uh, obviously there's enough uh, to write a book about it, and it spans uh, a ten-year, pretty, pretty yes, fulsome book, and I love every minute of it. Every a, line a, of a, it, yeah. a ten-year friendship and a kind of ongoing conversation about creativity. Um, when I uh, finally came up with the art imperative title, um, it was a Christmas party, and um, I, I approached him and I said, "Andy, I'm writing a book." And it's entitled The Art Imperative. And I'm interviewing artists uh, for the book. Would you be willing uh, to do that? And this I'm was interested... in 19... 1976, right? Uh, no, this is, I met him in 76. This is around 85, 84. Okay. Got it, right. Got uh, it. 85. Um, so um, I said, you know, I'm writing this book. Would you? interview with me it's titled the art imperative and he said it is typical way oh i have that i like the title and i said well you know let's talk about it from childhood on you know your need to make art and he said if i didn't make art i don't know what i'd do and um it was from that point that you know i was very excited to have him in the book and then um two months later he dropped it So um, interviewing Andy was never going to happen, but the idea never went away. And it cooked there for 30 years. And finally, I said, you know, get it done. Just put it down. Uh, And and that's what you have there. Uh, What I think the essence that I would like to communicate about Andy and neuroscience is that I've created in the art imperative a a systemic model that could be called the uh, brain-mind. There's a system, the brain-mind system. uh, It's a feedback loop. And then um, what that uh, individual brain-mind and social system of brains and minds does is make art, which informs culture. So the brain-mind art culture system is a single complex system from, you know, molecular to uh, global systems. And what so impressed me with Andy over the years was this very simple Im- impression. He does it all. He, he spends a lot of time daydreaming, the essential brain state, divergent brain state, in order to uh, free your associative cortex to uh, talk to each other, stop looking out, look in. Um, but then he's a businessman. He's got to pay all these people at the factory. And he loves business and selling things. So he he toggles back and forth between the divergent and convergent. So he runs a business and he creates this incredible stuff. Uh, and so when I also saw he's an advertiser, he's a filmmaker, there's nothing he doesn't touch. Fashion, music. When you think pop culture, you think Andy Warhol. You don't think the Beatles. 
um, Andy is pop culture. And he also was the end of abstract expressionism, and he did it with one painting. It is my favorite war all piece. Uh, it is the gold Marilyn, which is in the MoMA. It's this gigantic canvas, uh, which is all gold. And then right in the middle, like a postage stamp, is this Warhol Marilyn, which he did a whole series of those in small. But it is like, okay, fields painting, monochrome, minimalism, Barnett Newman. Uh, here's pop art right on top of you. This is what's next. Um, and he, he actually had a friendship with Barnett Newman. Um, so I think that gold painting was probably inspired by Newman's you know, massive uh, canvases that were very minimalistic. Um, but I, that's sort of um, the beginning of a long, complicated story with Andy that uh, I hope uh, people buy the book and read it because it was a lot of fun to write, a lot of wonderful memories and a lot of cool people. Um, so, um, that's, uh, where we're going next. Marvelous. So, so I'd like to end off on two quotes and get your final comments on this, because to me, um, you know, the beauty of art is it's a reflection of our non-conscious brains personally, culturally, as we've mentioned. And what I like about this quote from Andy Warhol is that it is all of all like a Rorschach test, all of art. All of symbols is is like is like a mirror, and he says this. He says people are always calling me a mirror, and if a mirror looks into a mirror, what is there to see? Tell us your thoughts about that. Context. Well, um, as you can tell, that is um, the enigmatic end, um, and there's another story at the end of the book that. Um, uh, he was contemplating dying, and he said, well, I, when I die, I think I want my tombstone to be blank. And then he thought about it and said, well, no, maybe not right enigma. And um, that, uh, that mirror looking into the mirror is timeless. It is out of time, out of space. Um, it is unreal. Um, one artificial reality looking at another artificial reality. We could say like one human brain looking at another and the mirror neuron systems registry back and forth or uh, an observer looking at an art piece and that mirror phenomena going on where the art is being remade by the creative systems in the brain of the uh, beholder. So Andy loved shadows. He loved mirrors. Um, he also said, you know, what would be the most beautiful room I can imagine, it'd be all white and it might have a window in the wall and that would be it, an empty white room with a window. So he was a minimalist at heart um, and a maximalist in terms of uh, stimulating the imagination of the beholder. Beautiful. I want to end off with um, with just a little further extension of the mirror. You know, I, I'm as a, an applied integrative neuroscientist who looks across the landscape of the brain and mind. I found very little of particular interest in the silos. To me, all the interesting thing happens things happen at the at the boundaries, the boundary between the non-conscious and the conscious brain, the dynamics, the nuances of the boundaries, um, and so. Andy was exploring those boundaries constantly. Now that I've, thanks to you, have this lens of his kind of just seemed to be being quite quiet and observational in a very deep kind of way. And I underestimated that as superficial and as trite in some ways, but it clearly wasn't. And as I put the pieces together, I could see he was kind of a, a, a deep non-conscious integrationist in his own way. And I love the ending. Um, because the boundary of uh, the ultimate boundary, of course, for humans is the boundary between life and death. And he has this quote at the, uh, that I'm going to draw our, our marvelous discussion to an end, which is this, that the, it's, the, it's about impermanence. The idea is not to live forever. It is to create something that will. I always thought I'd like my own tombstone. <laughs> To be blank, 
no epitaph and no name. Well, actually, I'd like it to say figment. <laughs>